Mark, how do you do? How's things, Daniel? How are you keeping? I'm keeping very well. Um, you're very welcome to my first ever, uh, I don't even know what to call it yet. I can't classify it as a podcast, but we, we'll, we'll call it um, the first ever discussion um, on a particular topic that we're both interested in on our video podcast. That's what we call it. The video. The video. Vod- the vodcast. Vod? Mark? You might have just come up with something. We'll see how that how people respond to that. So yeah. t- tell us a little bit uh, about yourself, Mark. Tell us about uh, what what do you do? Yeah, so my background is in sport science, uh, and I've always had an interest in sport nutrition in particular. So that's the the career path that I've pursued. And um, I've got a masters in sport nutrition, and I kind of describe myself as a research active practitioner, or some people kind of call it a, a academic and by that I mean is that you know I work in practice as a performance nutritionist in sports but I also maintain a role within research and kind of my philosophy for this is kind of I believe that you know being in practice certainly helps you ask better research questions and you know good research questions in my opinion is the fundamentals of good science particularly in an applied science like sports science and also on the flip side I believe that you know having a pulse on the research as is happening now kind of helps me make better decisions in the field and perhaps makes makes you a little bit more aware of kind of the pitfalls of certain research when you're trying to apply some of this science to practice. I like it. I like it. So uh, who do you practice with? Yeah. So at the moment I work with some professional fighters, uh, mainly boxing and also the Dublin senior hurlers. Oh, brilliant. I had a, a very enjoyable stint with the hurlers myself. It's uh, geez, 10 years ago. We won't, uh, we won't get into how long ago that is, but uh, I actually worked with some of the athletes that uh, you're currently working with some of the younger ones at the time. Um, they're a great bunch. Yeah, very sound bunch of lads. Very, very nice. Uh, to great to work with as well, to be honest. Yeah, they are. So let's get straight into uh, the whole topic of CBD. Um, I have uh, invited you on to have a chat about this because we've had some really good conversations, um, mainly actually online uh, through social media around the topic, and we've shared some of the same positions on on CBD. So what has raised your interest in CBD, Mark? Yeah, so I guess it kind of started like 2018 when WADA took CBD in particular off the prohibited list. And because I was working in combat sports at the time, and I don't know why, but CBD companies seem to have marketed very strongly towards combat sports. So if you're following a number of box MMA fighters or even MMA gyms on Instagram or Twitter, you'll see a lot that they're sponsored by CBD companies and, you know, they're all, they're pushing the CBD for enhanced recovery, enhanced sleep. And I had the the most common question I had fighters coming up to be asking was, you know, what what is CBD? Like, should I be taking CBD? You know, some of them are a little bit skeptical saying, oh, I'm seeing these people promoting CBD, but I'm not sure, you know, should I be taking it? Uh, And that's what kind of sparked kind of a research in terms of one, safety issues so is it safe for them to take these but two does cbd actually work for athletes or or at least does it have potential to work for athletes really really interesting uh i i would have had a a lot of the same type of, of questions myself um and it is amazing um but actually uh before i i kind of give you my own experience thus far on cbd what has been the general reaction within your environment to CBD when you give people and give these athletes your, your insights? Actually, to, at, the, at the moment, it's been quite receptive. Um, I think the, the lads that I've worked with, because they buy into the process that you're doing and they trust the process, they kind of trust your kind of expertise or opinion or advice when you do kind of say, you know what, it's, it might be a risk for this or yeah like you know it might help with this but if there's also this kind of side effect that we might get into or it might have this effect on the performance but it might have this effect on um training and, and so on uh, and they also know because in in combat sports depending on the fire uh, you might get really low 
uh, wage for a fight or pay for a fight. So they live off sponsors a lot of the time. So, mm-hmm. so they're very well aware that sometimes a lot of fighters are promoting stuff because they're being sponsored to, to promote it. Whereas general public might not kind of understand that mm-hmm. perception. Mm-hmm. You know, because if you're thinking about like a small hall show, in order for that fighter to actually fight and make money, he can't live off the money he gets from fighting. So they they, yeah. they require these sponsors. Uh, and it's just something for general public or even other athletes to be aware of that, you know, it is a business in, in promoting these products online. So at least mm-hmm. within the combat sport, they're kind of, they're pretty well aware of that. Mm-hmm. So what is CBD oil? Um, and what's the, the easiest way to explain it? And uh, then I'll let you, so I don't interject again, what are the potential benefits of it, if there are any? Yeah. Um, so in essence, CBD oil or whatever form you get it in, it's an e- extract from the cannabis plant. And I think this is p- the predominant reason why it's become so popular. I, I think if it wasn't an extract from the cannabis plant, it would not be as popular as it's been. You know, there's just a, a hype around the cannabis plant, you know, particularly with a push towards like med- medicinal cannabis and there's a recreational cannabis use. And if they can get some of the benefits from sport. And um, so it is just a, a kind of a cannabis extract and it's called like a cannabinoid. And there's about oh, at least 144 cannabinoids now identified in cannabis plant, but CBD and THC are the main ones. And THC is the psychoactive compound. So that's the stuff that gets you high essentially. It's why people go to Amsterdam on, on weekends away, uh, that and the flowers in the sea, Anne Frank. But, never been myself now yes yeah. yes <laughs> it's a nice it's actually a really lovely city um, yeah, yeah yeah i i don't doubt it i'm not saying i go for just to uh, to smoke a bit of wacky but yeah, i yeah. Uh, i definitely yeah, it'd be a great weekend trip i'm sure sorry yeah. for sorry um no, no. yeah irrelevant. when in rome when in rome yeah 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 so um so that, that's what they've done is THC, oh, sorry, I should backtrack a little bit. So in 2018, WADA, which is the World Anti-Doping Agency, actually took CBD off the prohibited list. So that means if you can source a CBD extract, which has really low THC, so the limit is like 0.3% less than that THC. If you can source CBD, well, then it's quote unquote fine to take during competition. And as well as that, the EU Commission also kind of regulate it as a novel food group so that it can be sold to general public. So from 2018, because you had like those two um, factors combined, you've had this massive, massive push in, in CBD. Like the market has grown very rapidly, same in the USA as well. And part of that market is trying to capitalize on sports and athletes and, uh, and general public because, you know, general public often probably a bigger market for supplements for sport supplements than the actual sport industry itself because sport industry is typically a little bit more conservative when it comes to you know giving supplements to their athletes so with regard to what are some of the benefits then so potential uh, yeah potential benefits there's there's actually some uh, really interesting research in london at the moment because um, as i was saying thc is the psychoactive compound gets you high but if you're, if you're really, really into the research with cannabis and some of the concerns around the kind of psychotic effects, you know, some people get really anxious and, and cause psycho- psychosis in a small number of people. So they're actually doing research. I think it's either U- University College London or King's College London, one of those two anyway. But what they're doing is they're growing cannabis strains. This is from medicinal cannabis process, for example. And by altering the amount of CBD, so if you turn up the CBD quantity in that cannabis um, strain, you actually end up counteracting some of the some of the psychotic effects of THC. So people are less anxious, less paranoid, for example, uh, and we can kind of see that replicated in CBD research alone. So it's probably the, the one area in humans where CBD does seem to have some benefit is in anxiety. So the model that they've used, so this research group in Brazil, the model that they've used to try to create an anxious environment is to get people at like a conference. So they use this conference model where they have to go out and give a talk. And then they'll obviously do like your kind of standard double blind placebo control trial. And they give CBD like an hour before going out to talk. And they find that people are less anxious when they take CBD prior to giving a, a conference talk, for example. So there is, 
there is, does seem to be that effect in the humans which hold with just CBD itself, because a lot of the times um, with CBD research, sometimes you have what's called an entourage effect, which means that whatever happens in the from a cannabis plant, sometimes you need all the cannabinoids there. But at least with regard to anxiety, it seems that there is one potential benefit fit with regard to anxiety, and I, you can see that in the kind of uh, research with the cannabis plant itself in medicinal research, but you also see it in kind of isolated CBD research. But when we think about some of the claims that are being made in sports, so marketing companies will push it a lot for sleep is a big one, uh, muscle damage and recovery is another big one, uh, and soreness and pain. And in Liverpool, they've actually done a survey of over 500 rugby players and about 26% had either admitted to taking CBD or were currently taking CBD, which is quite a large proportion. It's just one in four athletes. Huge. And it, sent, it tended to be skewed a little bit more to older athletes as well. So maybe people who are at the back end of the career and suffering a little bit more with pain. Mm. Uh, and bear in mind, these are also all drug tested athletes. Um, so the rugby league, rugby union, so, and they likely have had, you know, uh, anti-doping education yet they're taking a supplement which is a potential anti-doping doping risk because of the perceived benefits and the, about 80 percent of the respondents the received benefits were sleep pain and recovery so obviously if an athlete does think they're going to get increased sleep uh, improved recovery and you know an improvement in pain that's a big one because particularly like in, in collision sports or even in combat sports where you're getting hit a lot, you're getting collisions a lot. You know, you've had the introduction of alcohol bans in the last couple of decades, probably with the era of your kind of Arsene Wenger, Ferguson, it kind of transformed sport in general. So athletes aren't really going out on the beer afterwards and kind of, you know, drowning their pain in, in loads of alcohol. So what you, what you see is actually an increase in prescription painkillers and prescription painkillers are about, I think, five times higher in sports than in the general population. So if you can use, like this is the, the theory behind it, is that if you can use a safe supplement so that you're not pumping your body full of drugs all the time to reduce that pain, you know, help you recover a little bit quicker and help you get to sleep a little bit better, you know, it sounds logic from, from that perspective. Uh, but the science isn't quite there to kind of confirm or deny, deny some of them either. So it's not there to confirm or deny at the moment. It's quite, it's very, very raw. A lot of the science at the moment is from animal models. So what they do is they'll, they'll, they'll do lots of research on rats. So I'll, I'll, I'll say, for example, exercise induced muscle damage. So what they're trying to target when we hear about, you know, muscle damage and recovery, sometimes what they're trying to target is the inflammatory process. Because a lot of prescription painkillers that athletes are taking are kind of prescription level um, anti-inflammatories, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. They're, they're very prevalent in sport. So if you can kind of counteract that anti-inflammatory process, and we see that in kind of like cell work and in rodent research, but there's a couple of problems here. So one, it's very hard to translate rodent research into the humans anyway to the model that they predominantly use in this research is what they do is they inject them i think it's college with collagen induced um, arthritis so they inject them to give the, the rats arthritis to induce an inflammatory response as part of the arthritis and then they treat them with cbd so so not only is it rodent research but then you've got to think you know is you know collagen induced arthritis a good model to transfer into exercise induced muscle damage uh, po possibly not you know i couldn't definitively say no but i'd be skeptical and then the third issue with some of this kind of anti-inflammatory research at the moment is the dose so it's very hard to transfer dose from rodents to, to animal or rodents to humans anyway but it, the dose that they're using in rats at the moment is about so some of it is over 10 milligrams per kg. Some of it is 20 to 40 milligrams per kg. So if we use 10 milligrams per kg and we use an example of a 100 kilogram athlete, that's 1,000 milligrams of CBD or a gram of CBD, wow. which is, and if you look at, like CBD is not a cheap supplement. It's no. not. And that's about a full bottle of uh, CBD. So you're thinking about mm. every time you use CBD, if you want to get, 
you know, if the supposed anti-inflammatory effects, you almost have mm. to take a, a full bottle. Mm. Uh, and I, I'll just backtrack with anxiety. The, the effect of dose with an anxiety seems to be 300 milligrams. Mm-hmm. So not much, not much better. Still, still a very high dose, 300 milligrams. The only thing I'll say with that is that the anxiety research, they use all capsules. So you take a 300 milligram pill uh, and that's what they use that. You actually get like a dose. In anxiety, it seems that you actually get like a, an inverted U. So you get, uh, they use like 100, 150 milligrams, 300 milligrams. But then when you start going up to like 600 milligrams, you start getting that kind of downward downward effect. Okay. So there seems to be a sweet spot. Can I draw out um, a couple of important things that I, I want to get, I suppose, from a research perspective, but also your own personal opinion on? Um, you mentioned the potential doping risk. Can you give us uh, just a, an insight to why CBD could be potentially a, a doping risk? Yeah. So one thing is that first and foremost, you can't really get any tested CBD supplements. So even if you're buying a whey protein, for example, it's always important if you're competing in a drug test of sport to try to get some sort of batch certificate to guarantee that the supplement you're taking has been tested and is, is free of any contaminants, which might violate a water uh, on the water prohibited list another thing is that while supplements are claiming not 0.3 not less than 0.3 percent there's been some studies that show very wide variance in the actual amount of thc found in some of these supplements which again further emphasizes the, the real need to get tested supplements and it may not be on purpose from the supplement it's not like they're purposely putting in extra thc mm-hmm. i know I have spoken to some supplement companies and it's just really difficult to get the THC content down to a level which is permissible for athletes. So um, Healthspan, for example, is a, is a pretty reputable company in the UK and they have an elite range and a normal range. They actually yes. sell CBD okay. in the normal range. So I, I have asked them about it and they just can't get the THC low enough for them to put it in their elite range. Wow. So that's... So that's that's why they haven't kind of right. selling it selling it to athletes at the moment. No. It's it's meant to be very difficult to do in in Europe. It's, uh, that's the feedback and, I've had. and Mark, what about all of the companies that are saying that they've got a tested product and that they're selling it as a tested product for athletes? Yeah, what you'll have with some of them is they're they're tested to be free of THC, and you'll have, as I said before, there's about up to 144 different ca- cannabinoids in these pro- are cannabis plant mm. and while they may be getting the thc low enough it doesn't guarantee that they're free of all the other cannabinoids and yeah. all none of the other cannabinoids except for cbd have been taken off the water prohibited list at the moment okay. so you could end up getting flagged i don't know how likely it is because we like we probably need, we, what we really need to do is do the studies to find out how much of these other cannabinoids are coming up in the mm-hmm. urine after you've done it to see you know if it is a doping risk but because we don't know and because none of the supplements are tested for all of them, mm. it, it, it's just a big risk. And I recall it, there's been at least one case study now where someone's taken a CBD supplement and has been received a violation because I'm wow. sure that was because THC content though. Right. It's interesting because, I mean, if you, if you were to transfer the kind of dosage that you're suggesting that would be needed for the product to be of benefit, and then if you were to think, okay, well, if there is a contaminant in that product and you're taking very very large doses then there's def well I need to be very careful about my language here but there's certainly an increased risk there yeah like in my opinion it's too big a risk to be taken at the moment because the benefits are kind of theoretical at the moment mm-hmm. you know if there was a little if you had a little bit stronger research you could almost understand why some people because at least i was going to push the boundaries um, so you could understand the, why they would push the boundaries in, in some respect if there was like solid research that mm. this is definitively going to help in, mm. in these areas, even though you, you couldn't support it, you could understand it a little bit more. Yeah. But at the moment, the risk to reward ratio is just is mm. completely off. Yeah. Because even... Sorry, yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. I was going to, even with regard to sleep, um, after anxiety, sleep is probably the next area where we've got best... I say best research, it's still not a lot of research, but we've got about four or five human studies. Now, there's a problem because they're all using different doses and the different forms that they're consuming it in and they're measuring sleep. Different. Some are using questionnaires, some might be have like a watch. 
But the best one so far is from this same group in Brazil who have done the anxiety research. And what they did is they measured um, sleep with polystenography. And what they do is they attach le electrodes all over your head so you can measure brain activity when you sleep. So it's considered the gold standard of sleep. So you're not relying on people reporting back to you or you're not even rely relying on how long they're in bed. You can actually measure how long you sleep, how long it takes you to get to sleep and the different stages of sleep. And they found that there was no effect of CBD on any of the parameters of sleep architecture, which to me kind of insinuates that, you know, there's probably not a massive effect of CBD on sleep. People, I think people, again, are, are tying it to cannabis and, you know, you might feel a bit sleepy after, you know, going to Amsterdam for a weekend. It might be early nights or something like that. Mm. But because, like, they're, you're kind of muddying up the effects of cannabis mm. plant itself with CBD, uh, and they are going to have very different effects because, mm. like, even in just in terms of the effect that they're in the body, they bind to different sites in the body and so yes. on. So it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a different system, acts on different systems, and it's just it's a different supplement than cannabis itself. Yeah, I, I think that there's a, there's a lot of different ways that our conversation on it could go, and I suppose it's important for me to state from the outset that uh, there is a, there's a little bit of bias in me um, towards the risk associated with, um, with, with CBD at this point, because so many of the athletes that I work with are tested on a, on a regular basis, and I just don't want to have that risk in, in you know, you just don't want that as a, as a potential uh, risk for the athletes that you work with. And I, so, so it's important to state that, I mean, I'm excited and I'm open to innovation in any aspect of sports nutrition. But one of the things I think I have learned as a, as a key element to the use of any supplement is the, the placebo effect and the risk benefit and the, you know, the actual real potential of a product compared to all of the other things that we know work within nutrition. So, you know, you mentioned sleep there and people, athletes, people on social media regularly ask me about, about sleep and potential products for sleep. And I've had my own sleep issues in the past. And, and one of the biggest things that I've realized is that it's about your behaviors. It's about your routine. It's about what you do consistently. And we have this draw just it's it seems to be like an inbuilt part of our psychology that if we can take something that will help us to achieve whatever it is our health performance goal we we are willing to do that rather than taking a, a step back and reviewing our behavior so sleep is a good example and i think we want to believe we want to believe that this is helping because it's an easier solution so I, I, I think even in terms of the, the research, the potential benefits, even relating to the management of anxiety, uh, from, from my experience, the things that tend to help most or have the biggest significant impact are, you know, what are you doing from a lifestyle point of view? What are you doing from an exercise point of view? Have you looked at mindfulness? Have you looked at breathing techniques? Have you practiced your information so you don't have the same level of anxiety? You know, the actual things that will, in the long term, sustain behaviors that will allow you to perform better and better. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, I, think, I think sometimes people are so fixated on the 1% and don't spend enough time on the 99% because it's the... It really is it's, with it, most things with training, with nutrition, with everything, with sleep is the basics that get you most of the results. And I think people are too fixated on trying to chase, you know, the, the extra 1% when the, you should be focusing more on the fundamentals. And then once you get the fundamentals down, which, as you say, it's not just nailing the fundamentals, it's embedding those fundamentals in your, your habits and your routine and your behavior so that it becomes, you know, natural to you so th those kind of basics are built into you and they're natural and then when you're at that kind of high level then you can maybe consider you know maybe there is a supplement that i can use or mm -hmm. but it, it's a, it should be a second thought rather than people's first thoughts which I, I think it often quite is mark have you um have you taken cbd yourself yeah yeah i've got um a s sample over there um and you know what because have like a back injury at the moment and i've been taking anything 
that it would help me. And anecdotally, I don't think it does anything whatsoever. You know, I like as I, I was I was in a lot of pain, so I was I was like, all right, I'll take this CBD, and I was taking what the recommended doses on the bottle for a couple of days, and I personally found absolutely zero effect. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm not I'm. I'm not yeah. sold. Like, if it had some sort of anecdotal benefit, I'd be like, oh, maybe this, maybe the research might show something. But mm. and my anecdotal ex- experience at the moment um, kind of contrasts to, to that of some of the rugby players in the survey who do kind of perceive a benefit. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> Mark, thanks very much. This has been brilliant, even from my own perspective. It's been great to have a conversation about it. I've really, really enjoyed it. Um, can you do me a favor? Can you do two things? Can, can you give a really, I suppose, concise summary? of I'm an athlete, I'm 32 years of age, I want to do everything that I possibly can to uh, support my recovery and, and do what I need to do to, to consistently achieve my performance. Can, I'm considering taking CBD. What's the kind of, you know, the, the, the short summary from your perspective on it? That's the first yeah. part. I suppose the key points would be, you know, there are some plausible benefits uh, however there's a real lack of research and to add to that if you are competing in a a drug tested sport so you know very compete like any type of drug tested sport you're going to run the risk of you know it'd be more time out of your career than you'd extend to your career if you got a doping ban because if you ended up getting a doping ban and got two six months two years four year ban you're going to take more time off. You're risking more time to your career than you are risking adding to your career with the use of a supplement like CBD at the moment. So that, that'd be kind of my, my advice is, you know, the verdict at the moment would be stay clear at le- at the very least until you had a supplement, which could kind of quote unquote guarantee you that you weren't going to fail any tests coming up in the future. That's brilliant, Mark. Um, thanks very, very much for your time. And the second part was if um, people wanted to learn more about CBD um, and also you, where, where can we, um, where could we contact you if we wanted to have a conversation with this? Or maybe, maybe there's some athletes out there, um, maybe weight making athletes that uh, would like to get in touch with you um, on, on some of the things that we've discussed. So yeah, I suppose my my instagram is mjermain 91 and i have no problem um answering questions like yeah, people ask me um questions uh, all the time I've, I've, i respond to questions all the time it's probably the easiest form i'm on twitter as well but um it's, it's harder to probably ask questions on on twitter because you got a little bit on twitter i'm just at mark jermain um, but instagram is probably better if, to get if you wanted to just ask me questions and get kind of detailed responses and um, mjermain 91 is where you'll find me Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure. I've really, really enjoyed it. And uh, I'm sure that there'll be other topics that we'll, we'll, uh, we'll discuss on here again in the, in the future. Thanks very much for, for, for coming on. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it.